Well, friends, this week we will be starting to look at the soul trade of honor. Let me pull up here is where we are in our trip through the uh, IJS Tikkun Midot curriculum. And this is the first of our two weeks uh, doing uh, Kavod, which can be translated as respect or honor. So for our initial check-in, um, there's a couple of choices. Uh, last week I sent out an email about you know, one's dignity being slighted, which is very much related to, to Kavod or honor. Um, or if you'd like, you can check in on love and kindness and see where has love and kindness shown up for you in the, uh, in the last few weeks. I'm gonna stop the share. So would anyone, uh, who would like to, to begin? Yes, Joanne. Joanne, you're on mute. I had an interesting time with the loving kindness, you know, greeting people and having different reactions from people. And actually, my first re instance was I, I was going out, the mailman was coming in, I held the door for him and thanked me. And I said, well, you had perfect timing or something like that. And then I left and I said, oh, I am supposed to be greeting. <laughs> this was the day, you know? So then I was more aware. I walked to the corner. There was a guy who was like walking from behind me, walked a little bit ahead. I said, how are you? Or something like that. He turned around and gave me a thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> so those were two positive. And then, you know, I had mixed bags with some people I found. I mean, it's interesting. It's a very mixed neighborhood where I live. There's a lot of Hispanics. I don't know why my eyes are looking here, but I'm trying to look at you. I don't know. But anyway, um, who a lot of people were on their phones, so you couldn't even reach them. Mm. But I started, you know, I just tried to be putting something out, you know, <laughs> and mm. connecting. And I think I got better at it as time went on. And so that was, you know, my experience of that some people, you know, they're just not, they're avoiding looking at you and they're looking at their phone or anywhere else. So they got mm -hmm. headphones on and they're looking at their phone and, you know, they'll never see you or hear you. But some people, you know, if I just greet people as I walk by there and they're sitting on the porch or whatever, I usually get a response. Um, mm, thank you. And so that was nice. Yeah, thank you, Joanne. Thank you for sharing that. No problem. I know I had shared in my email that, um, you know, this, this practice of, uh, you know, where I'd kind of gotten a bunch of little annoying things where I was getting, uh, you know, I realized I was kind of getting a little bent out of shape and uh, it was sort of helpful to kind of work to, put it in perspective. And then when I got more mindful about it, at one point, you know, my wife had done something and I was a little, and then I was like, you know, she's just doing her thing. You know, that's just the way she, she like handles it. She asks lots of questions. What's the big deal? And it was, you know, like that, it was gone. It was over. So that was, that was very helpful for me. Um, anyone else like to share? Yeah, Carol. So this is my first week going out and doing things. So I went out to dinner twice. And as you know, I've been riding the horses and all. And the people I went, first I went out with, with a good friend from synagogue and she was so considerate of me. You know, are you comfortable with this? Uh, do you like this table or would you rather sit here? How's this working? Because she was checking in with me all the time. This is the same woman that went with me to get my jabs. And then I went out last night as every month, my Wednesday writing group, which I'm trying to get back into, um, I'll get together to celebrate whoever's birthday it is that month. Well, it happens that it's mine this month. So I really wanted to go, but I was very nervous about it. This group, they were so considerate, mm. understanding, 
And when it came to the end of the evening, our, we call her our social director, the one who sets this all up, wanted to give me a hug. And I went, oh, I couldn't do it. Mm. I said, no hugs yet. I said, I'm not there yet. And she was like, she just gave me a fist bump. Mm. Perfect. So I was the recipient in some very big ways. And my writing instructor has been the same way. You know, are you comfortable with this? And she said to me last time, she goes, you can come back to Western Club because everybody in club is vaccinated. Mm. And I went, how sweet of her. To, I didn't even ask her. And this is the Saturday group that I was in before. I was writing Wednesdays and Saturdays. And uh, I just, people have just been really kind to me and the understanding of these weird boundaries I have to deal with. So gratitude. Thank you, Carol. Thank you so much. It's wonderful, wonderful to hear you're back on the horse and back out in the world. Um, anyone else care to check in? Okay, well, let's start to look at, um, let's start to look at honor. So may I have a volunteer to read uh, this first bullet, please. And I can't see all of you, so please just uh, unmute yourself and jump in. Kavod is a palpable sense of presence. It is receiving everyone, including ourselves, with ayan tova, alive with divine, ultimate goodness, we are getting out of the way of the relentless critic and judge. Rabbi Sheila Peltz Weinberg, IGS, Tikkun Midot Curriculum. Thank you, Janet. Okay, so what is uh, Rabbi Weinberg, uh, Peltz Weinberg, saying to, uh, to us? How is she defining honor or kavod? Well, it's treating everybody as though we each have that divine spark within us and therefore are worthy of consideration and, re and, and respect mm -hmm. and not judging other people all the time. You know, we have a tendency to judge, well, he thinks this way and therefore he's this, whatever that is, or he looks this way, she looks this way, therefore it must be. Mm. So that I think is, is that big judge in our head that we need to, you know, knock that guy out of the way sometimes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a, protective me it's a protective mechanism too, and we need to use it, but most of the time we need to rein it in. Yeah. Yeah, what's the, what's the, the downside of, of judging? I mean, as you say, lots of us do that and you know, many times it doesn't serve us. How, how doesn't it serve us? What's, what's wrong with that, about constantly judging other people? It's a very negative outlook. Mm -hmm. And also, I thought an important part was also not judging and criticizing ourselves, mm. you know. So as we are to others, we're probably to ourselves also. And who knows you know, which came first, probably ourselves. Um, you know, like if you think you have to be perfect. No, no. And, and the ayin tova, I know that's, I, you said something about that. I mean, that's in Pirkei Avos, the ethics of the fathers, you know, that we should look at people you know, expecting good, you know, and not expecting negative stuff. Yeah, we look at them with a good eye. You know, we try to right. we try to look for the good and not, right. you know, nitpick like the uh, like the the small things. Great, great. Okay, now perhaps someone we haven't heard from yet to read the second bullet. So now it's like, well, how do we cultivate this in ourselves? And yeah, it's. Great to say, oh yeah, I'm, I'm gonna stop judging people, but it can be much, much harder to do that. So maybe some we have not heard from yet to read the next bullet. I'll do that. Thank you, Frank. Uh, the first step in cultivating the Mida of Kavod and indeed all spirituality 
is comprehending one's own significance. Kavod comes from the Hebrew root KVD, KVD, meaning heavy or weighty. Its opposite is KL, Koflamed, meaning light or insignificant. We need to perceive our own significance as made in the divine image. If we could fully integrate this truth, we wouldn't seek external recognition. Mm -hmm. We would treat ourselves with kavod out of an inborn awareness of our inherent value. Great, thank you, Frank. So what does this mean to kind of comprehend our own significance or comprehending? Yeah, what is, what is he talking about there? Randy, any thoughts about this one? What, what it means to kind of comprehend one's own significance? Well, I do, I do have a thought. Uh, just when I read through uh, the email, there was the quote about being kavod and the three things that separate a person from the world. And, mm -hmm. and I tried to read a little bit and understand. It, and I, I was thinking about those, the two slips of paper, you know, where one says, I'm just dust and ashes. And the other says, well, the universe was made for me. Mm -hmm. And... Um, that idea with weightiness, I think it has that idea of balance. In balance, it's like it's like saying hey, life is like walking a tightrope, and you know you have to, you yeah. know, and it's like who you are applying that weightiness. Maybe honor isn't the right word. You know, it's like, oh, you know, I'm worthless or whatever. Well, no. Or it's like, oh, man, I just won this. I'm really hot stuff. And it's like, no, you know, and <laughs> beyond that, it's like, well, I'm going to make mistakes and I am part of the, the universe of other people in a larger, it's like, in the Hebrew word, it's like the it's like physics. It's like saying there's this structure in the, the universe between energy and forces and work and and I'm just thinking to myself, you know, that safety net underneath because I know other people and the things beyond them, the universe and God are important because that is the safety net. It's what uh, of repairing the world it's what keeps the world working so maybe mm. that's a bit of a distraction but that's where i'm thinking in trying to get a grasp on uh on what kavod means yeah i think that was really beautiful randy and it makes a lot of sense and i think it is um very much related to the this idea of the two slips of paper and sort of understanding your own place in the universe. And if you're mm -hmm. too into yourself or you're not enough into yourself. And I think it's especially the latter. I mean, I I think of um, like a kavod is very related to anava, which is honor, which is or which is um, which is humility. And mm -hmm. I think they're both because they're both about kind of our relationship to other people. And humility tends to focus more on, well, what's my place in the relationship with the, the other? And honor tends to be, well, what's the other's place in the relationship with me? So there's sort of two sides of the same coin. And, um, you know, <coughs> what happens when we're off? You know, I think that's part of what they were saying, and I'll bring the, the reading back up. I think what the, there's a warning that um, you know if we're not um, kind of understanding our own significance, then then what happens when we're when we're maybe down on ourselves a little bit? Again, this is to the group. I'm 
struck by the uh, contrast because some religions teach that we're nothing, we're, you know, the, the dust. And even in Judaism, there's a story about the, the rabbi, the, the cantor, and the shamus. You probably heard it. The yeah. rabbi says he's nothing. And then the, the other guy says he's nothing, the synagogue president. And then the uh, the shamus or, or you know really gets down and starts graveling and the others say look at who thinks he's nothing yes <laughs> yes <laughs> and there's a, a danger in you know I know that you know we're nothing but dust we're nothing but this or the ego thing where we allowed ourselves to to soar a little too high Mm -hmm. and knocked off and knocked over and the question is yes it's a question of balance yeah absolutely and there is um you know because we're um and i can't remember if i included a reading on this or not but it's something that we've talked about many times how we're all created in the, in the divine image and i think that's a big part of this is really understanding that we have that inner divinity and yes we are um you know we we need to kind of thread that needle and uh i think sometimes people can kind of overdo it with this you know i'm nothing i'm dust i love that i love that joke because it's like you know we're going to have the contest to see who is truly the most humble or the most you know <laughs> The most lowly among the group and obviously they've all just just very much uh, missed the boat um mm -hmm. uh there's this other thing about you know seeking external recognition like if we don't feel our own significance you know there's this danger that we might be seeking external recognition what um what does that mean is that, how does that relate to your own life? Gary, yeah. Well, um, it sounds like a self-esteem issue. Mm. Um, if you feel that uh, you're less than someone else, mm -hmm. you should never feel that way. Um, Neither are you better than someone else, mm -hmm. uh, and um, and it's and there's another saying: it's always not about you. How, how some people make these assumptions about themselves or how people feel about them, mm -hmm. and um, and go on that track that oh he doesn't like me or I did this, and uh, but it's not about you. Mm -hmm. It's generally about them. But if you have low self-esteem, um, then you're, you know, you're a victim of that type of thinking. Yeah, thank you, Harry. And uh, you know, as you're talking about that, and you know, as this you talk about this issue of external recognition, I'm reminded of my my ten years in the corporate world, which is just built all around and giving me little pats in the head. You know, it's like, oh, you did a great job with this. And we're going to give out a little plaque to people who did this and that. And it can kind of erode your own, like, sense of, you know, you know, it can kind of start to take the place of sort of internal rewards. And it starts becoming about getting the bonus, getting the pat on the head. And then when things don't go well, they can really, you know, some companies and some people can really come down hard on you. And I, I took that pretty hard. And I got really caught up in this kind of recognition game. And it was, um, you know, it was painful. Uh, it was a painful set of experiences for me. So I'm just wondering, like, when you're in that place where you're feeling like that intrinsic recognition, how's your life different? And what might that do for you if you could kind of feel, feel better in that way? Yeah, Nancy? Yeah, I think it kind of depends on the situation. Um, cause I had something happen and, you know, I'm trying to figure about, you know, this honor, like where is my place and feeling comfortable with what I have and honoring that and what happened. And I was, um, some of you know, I was involved in a songwriters group 
And all of a sudden I got an email and they said they wanted to talk to me before the next week's meeting. And I called them and they basically told me that I was kicked out of the class. Oh. And that was like, wow, where's the honor? Where's the respect? Where's the non-judgment of me showing you my deepest soul of my um, compositions, mm -hmm. you know, and, and so I had to, or I felt a need to wonder, am I really that bad? No. Okay. Stop with this low self-esteem mm -hmm. say, I have a gift. It may be different from theirs and we're just not a good match. Mm -hmm. And I had to reach out to some of my fellow musicians what is this about? Mm -hmm. And so this kind of external recognition, I don't feel was really self-esteem issue. It was, how do we musicians non, uh, not judge each other, but appreciate each other's differences and uniqueness? And the people I reached out to were horrified that a class could just dismiss you and it was very hurtful and I'm still struggling as I guess I thought I was over it. So how do we, you know, this kind of goes into the honor of respecting ourselves, not judging ourselves. Like, no, I'm okay. My stuff is okay. It's just different. So I let it go, but it was hard to do. And it, I guess it's still hard to do to some, to some extent because uh, I was really shocked at what they did. Well, thank you for sharing that, Nancy. I'm, I'm listening. I'm listening with an open heart. That does sound like a very, very painful experience, and I'm glad that um, you have people that could support you and believe in you, and you know, were able to kind of help help lift you up. Because we all, you know, none of us can get through all of these things on our own. You know, we need other people. And when you have like a rejection like that, it's incredibly shocking and painful to go through. So um, I'm so glad there were people who were, were able to lift you back up again. Yeah, Carol. I think there's a balance because when you're learning particularly, you, you, you're asking questions. Is this right? Is this, you know, is this where I should be looking? Is this where I should be going? And you need the feedback saying, yes, yes, I, I mean, I, I, you know, I'm taking writing lessons and I do certain things and it's like, I need to hear from my instructor, my trainer. Mm -hmm. Yes, you're doing the right thing. I need to hear it from the horse as well. But that's, that's another subject because that's a conversation too between rider and horse. But that's not praise necessarily. Mm -hmm. And I think what this is talking about is needing external praise, like, oh yes, you're wonderful, oh yeah. You need to hear if your project, you put your project out in business, whether it's gonna work or not, or whether it's got problems, but you don't need to be told, oh, you're a wonderful person because you did this project. You know that if the project is good and you know if you write something or whatever, you know that if it's good, um, you should be doing it, but it's helpful to get the feedback. And sometimes the feedback is, you know, you had a problem here. You really need to look at this. Mm -hmm. So it's a balance like everything else. Right. Yeah. Thank you, Carol. Yeah. Harry. Yeah. As you might know, Greg, some of the greatest scientific discoveries had a lot of uh, naysayers and it's because of the persistence of the person that's being victimized, people it be, then becomes realized as, oh my God, you're right. <laughs> and there's a classic story that actually has to do with today. Uh, Mal Malcolm Gladwell tells the story of uh, a scientist. I don't forgot his name, but he was he, he there was a there was something with certain chickens that developed cancer, mm. and. Um, so it's cancer, you know, it's a disease. And he, he was really curious about where does this cancer come from? How does this chicken get cancer? And through his studies, he realized that he got cancer through a virus. Mm. Oh my God, how can you have cancer through a virus? How, how can a virus cause cancer? 
And he wrote all these papers and he got thrown out from his group. I mean, it was just unbelievable. Mm. And then they were able to replicate his discovery. And that discovery was RNA, mm. which is the, which is allowed Pfizer and Madonna. And, and so, them. you know, this uh, virus, um, this um, vaccine has been in the making for a number of years. It just didn't happen last year. Mm. And it's because of this little science, the scientist persistence that, that it came, cancer came from a virus, not, not from a, D, a DNA that they discovered this. So you just, sometimes you just gotta hang in there if you think you're right. And it's hard, it's just really hard. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Harry. Um, I think that's a great, that's a great example. I think it's a good segue to the next teaching from, from, uh, from Rav Cook. And I had just to kind of put, uh, oh, wait, here we are. Uh, it is, um, it's about the dangers of chasing honor. And that's this whole idea of trying mm. to chase down the praise or doing things in order to get the pat on the head or in order to get praise. So may we have a volunteer to, uh, to read this slide, please. Read if you like. The more, the more lacking one is in inner perfection, the more nature will seek to gain perfection on an outer level. It is only in a state of low level spirituality that there will be aroused in a person a desire to glorify himself before others, both with the virtues he possesses and with others he does not possess. It is therefore important for a person to enhance their level of inner perfection and their self-assessment in relation to others shall always be in the proper measure. Okay, great. So thank you, Carol. So Ralph Cook is sort of talking about this inner perfection and outer perfection. What's, what's the difference? What is he relating inner perfection to? Yeah, Janet. I can't help but think of our politicians, uh, including that Marlon <laughs> uh, You know, people bluster because they don't feel good about themselves inside. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's absolutely when someone gets very, you know, you know, if there if there's something not right inside, then they uh, can bluster, and seek praise. But there's also, you know, artists, etc., who never feel they're good enough, you know, mm. on the other side. Yeah, it's a really it's a very real thing. It's funny. I don't know if anyone else here watches The Voice. I'm a huge Voice fan. Oh, I love it. You know, and uh, it's these different music stars and they're judging amateur or, or like professional musicians. And it's a singing contest. And so one of the judges is Blake Shelf, who's a big country star. And, uh, you know, he said when he first got started, he didn't have a care in the world. He didn't have any money. He was nervous. He was just out there making music, trying to, trying to make it in the business. And he said, now that he's had a bunch of success, he's nervous all the time. You know, am I going to have another hit? Is it going to be this? Is it going to be that? So it is, um, there's a constant sort of internal and external battle. Now it's interesting, Rav Cook seems to be relating this internal to spirituality. So what role like, might spirituality play in kind of building, building our inner world? Shelly. Um, you know, it's interesting. I, I love coming on these Zoom meetings after I've had a bit of a break uh, to see what has happened in my life. But uh, yesterday I was uh, given the opportunity to watch a YouTube uh, show uh, or reading of Jonathan Living Seagull. I don't know if anyone has read that book or heard it, but it's basically about a seagull that doesn't just want to be like a seagull. He wants to fly. And so he learns to fly. And he goes up to heaven basically. And um, the, the, the head, uh, I, whatever Seagull said to him, to, to reach perfection is to be limitless. 
And, you know, so to hear all this, you know, kind of gives me that sense of, yeah, it's, it's letting go. It's just being love and, and, you know, loving everything that you come across, you know, even the imperfections and stuff and not to judge others, but to, you know, clean your own mirror. And uh, so, you know, I thoroughly enjoyed today. Thank you. Thank you, Shelley. Yeah, there was uh, one of the readings that I didn't share. I think it said something like, you know, if your mirror is dirty, then you're going to see imperfections when we look into someone else because they're a mirror of, of us. Mm -hmm. And if our mirror is clean, then we see, you know, beauty wherever we look because, mm -hmm. because our, our mirror is clean. And so this the spiritual world, I think, is about, you know, it's, it's very much about that. It's about cultivating that, um, you know, it's about cleaning the mirror. So what, are, what are ways that we can do that? Or what are some, you know, that's, that's kind of why we're here, I think, and why we're going through these. This is a, a spiritual practice. It is a way of kind of building our inner world. But what, what does that look like for you? Or what are things that you can do to kind of clean your own mirror? Yeah, Joanne. Well, I think, you know, like doing that love and kindness practice, but like working on these me do it, I think is a way, you know, of helping us see ourselves and balance ourselves and see others in a more honest way instead of like projecting uh, some negative idea or, or some kind of assumption that we have. And I think, you know, studying the wisdom that is in our, our religion, if we're in this, this religion or whatever religion we're in, because they all have wisdom uh, literature, you know, to like, what's important to focus on, you know, who is rich, one who is content with what he has, who is happy, you know, you know, that kind of thing. And it is internal. It's not external. And then if we work on ourselves, like I said, that clean, helps clean our mirror. And also if we practice relating to people in a good way, and without like assumptions or expectations of something negative, then we get a better response. Yeah, thank you, John. Mm -hmm. Ellis, you look like you're, you're percolating a little bit. Do you have anything you'd like to add to the conversation or perspectives you'd like to share? I think it's interesting. I was thinking of an experience I had this week. Um, I'll try to make it kind of brief. Um, sort of an ongoing, maybe eight sessions of dialogue about race in a large sort of state statewide group. And um, I'd been to several different sessions before, and we would have these breakout rooms. And so I knew this person, that person. And, you know, we'd have these small groups and discuss, and then come back. Well, I went to one breakout room and there was only one other woman and uh, we had a conversation. We were talking about our identity, our sense of identity of who, who we are, who we appear to be, who we kind of present ourselves as. Mm -hmm. And um, then we went to another breakout room. I was the only one there. Mm -hmm. And it was so odd to just be sitting there for 20 minutes looking at this picture of myself. And so I went back to the group and I told the conveyor, conveners, I said, I was the only one in my breakout group. And it was very strange. And I don't know where this woman went. And then at the very end, sort of I gathered with the two leaders, the two young women that were leading, and another woman who had written a book that I found on my shelves and mm. a book about the blues which is an important kind of music for me. And we just gathered together in silence for a long time. And it was such a, I thought, what a, what a wonderful experience that came out of something that felt kind of like being kicked out and, you know, dropped and dumped. And I could put a different perspective on it. Just sort of, this has been a gift. So I don't know if other people have had that experience, but um, it reminded me, of, I've read the beginning of your book about sort of when you sort of butted heads with the corporate world 
and sort of saw that there was a, a blessing in that or a gift. So I think that often these strange experiences can be a gift. Yeah, there's, there's definitely, um, it's definitely something very much that spirituality can give us these sort of tools to kind of hang in there and to shift our perspective, to kind of look for the gift in a situation and something which may start out as kind of awkward or geez, and what's going on here can, you know, if you hang in there, can turn into something, you know, really, really cool and amazing. You know, for me, I uh, have my heart set on doing, uh, I, need, I need to do two years of internship and live in upper school. And the, uh, I was going to do my clinical pastoral education internship this fall, and I was getting all set. And turns out the program was full, and they deferred me for a year. Mm. And now I need to do a different type of internship. So I'm going to do like my rabbinical internship. So I don't know if it's going to be in the pulpit or the organization or Hillel or I don't know, but I'm trying to kind of take that, you know, non-judgmental attitude towards the school. This is just the way that's, you know, as my grandfather used to say, sometimes that's the way the cookie crumbles. You know, it wasn't like a personal thing against me. And I'm hopeful that there'll be some real gift in this uh, and that I'll find something really cool. And that you know, there'll be an opportunity which maybe wouldn't have been there otherwise. So, yeah, I can very much relate to what you were saying, Phyllis. Yeah, Frank. Frank, if you can unmute, please. I just thought about something and then I'm going to go back to some of my thoughts. Um, in recent years, um, it seems to me in terms of honor is when progressive students would wanna speak at Hillel, they were forbidden. And so there was a movement called Open Hillel. Basically progressive Jews were trying to kind of be invited to Hillel's. And to me that has to do with honor. How do we honor our differences? And what happened is today, unfortunately, unfortunately, Jewish students are in a similar pick pickle. They may be progressives, but they're not progressive enough because they may be pro-Zionists. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of playing out. I'm, I'm, I'm active in my community relations council here in Louisville. And so there's so what comes, you know, what they say is that what comes around goes around. Mm -hmm. So anyways, I'm just, because again, it has to do with, really has to do with honor. How do we listen to different voices? Yeah. And how do, and in that, how do we state our, you know, what's important to us, not to negate somebody else. Mm -hmm. So these are my kind of some thoughts that I had. Yeah, please. Is, the idea is that how do we learn to honor ourselves? Because I think it's only out of that journey can we begin to honor other people's truths? So one of the things I've noticed personally is that sometimes I make state, I'm, I would make statements that this is the way it is. And now I'm more careful and I say, this is the way I see it. And that allows others to state how they see it. And then we can honor each other because we're listening. Mm -hmm. Um, the other is, is that I think this is a question of maturity because there's so much competition when we're young. Um, what I mean in school, in grades, on the ball field, in so many ways. Um, and, you, and for to honor, to learn to really honor ourselves and others we really have to transcend that. And that it, to me is, 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 is a spiritual journey. Yeah, thank you, Frank. I think you said some really beautiful things there. And I particularly like, you know, the sort of the I statements about, you know, this is the way I see it. And I can very much mm -hmm. 
relate to that. Or, you know, yeah, if you like to say this is the way it is, but it is. So that's a very good practice to kind of lead with, you know, this is my perspective as opposed to mm -hmm. this is, you know, or the problem with X is blah, blah, blah. Well, I think maybe one of the problems with X is this, which then, as you say, opens the door for other people to have a conversation. And I think so much and what makes a spiritual practice different than other sorts of things, it's, it's always in, inwardly focused. Like I can't control anybody else's behavior, but I can control, you know, how I behave. And it's like, you know, we started with Joanne's story about I greeted a bunch of people and they reacted in all kinds of different ways. But by opening herself up and placing the greeting, it then opened the door for something, something to happen. Whereas if we, and when we feel good about ourselves, it's easier to open that door. Whereas, you know, if someone's just, oh, I'm, I'm too busy, I'm not going to look, it's like, okay, well, that's their issue. That's not my issue. So all of this is a great lead-in to our question for our partner study today. Mm -hmm. So, um, Janos, we haven't heard from you. Would you mind reading the, the paragraph, please? As early as the 13th century, Rabbi, Rabbi Nu Yona of Gerondi in 1260 Spain declared that the path of spiritual growth starts with knowing one's own worth. He tells us to remember that we have glorious ancestors, Abraham and Sarah, Sarah etc. We should comprehend that we descend from great people and share in their inheritance. Great, thank you. So as our experiment for today, you know, is there a way that Rabbi Yama's methodology might be something which is in our spiritual medicine cabinet? Is there some aspect of your life or ancestry that you feel positively about and might boost your own sense of significance? And if you've come from a more difficult background, you know, is there something else, you know, maybe outside of that direct background that you could still tie into maybe from the past? Um, so I will be really curious what people uh, have to say. I will split you up into your breakout rooms. Let me just see here. Okay, so the rooms are open, so you should see a button saying join breakout room. I will send a note when we're about halfway there. Okay, for those of you who've been live streaming, thank you so much for being here. I hope you will come back this week. Please come visit me at AmericanMoosart.com. You're invited to join our email list where every other week we get an email introducing the soul trait that we are working on. And you can also sign up for an optional weekly list where you'll get uh, a reminder about this meeting and also some ideas and practice tips. So until then, uh, please. Uh, as always, let's do our best to be mentions. Hello, hello, welcome back. Yeah, you were wondering what, what happened. <laughs> what do you mean? Yeah, uh, we were prepared for a short visit. But oh. <laughs> wow, well, so I gave you a little longer today. Okay, that's nice. Go ahead. Go ahead, go. All right, everyone else has a few seconds left, and then they will rejoin us. And here we are. So welcome back to the main room. 
So I would love to hear in what ways could kind of drawing into your ancestors, who, who might they be and how might they help? My father left me when he left, when he left, he said, I, I know you'll take care of your brother. That was, he died in 2001. Mm. It was a big commitment. I, I'm honored that he felt that I could handle it. Mm. I'm honored. I guess I feel that I'm doing the best I can. It is very, very difficult. Mm. And I feel like I'm less than. I'm not always up to the task. Mm. Thank you, Jenna. And if I'm understanding correctly, do those words your father bring you bring you comfort? Yes, they do bring me comfort. But I'm also remember the words of Tefia. I know I chosen, but couldn't you have chosen someone else? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But we didn't really talk about that, but I'm thinking about it right now. And I have always felt like I stand on the shoulders of those who came before me mm -hmm. and in so many ways, because, you know, my, my family, like all of us, emigrated here to the United States. And some of them were remarkably successful. My grandfather, my maternal grandfather was a doctor during the San Francisco earthquake. And he was really oh. quite the big cheese. <laughs> Mm. And they put him in charge of the biggest refugee camp, the one out at Chrissy Field. Mm. He was 24 years old. On the morning of, uh, on that morning, he had exactly one patient. Mm. And after that, he had hundreds. Mm. But he was quite, quite a character. I have a, a, a great grandfather on my father's side who was a congressman, one term, but he did one good thing. So, you know, mm. And I have, I have a lot of people in my, in my history that I think brought me to this place that by them lifting themselves up, they lifted up my generation. They lifted up my me, they lifted up my brothers and sister. So I think we should always give thanks for those, those people that struggled to get us here, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, thank you, Carol. Swing by the Yanos, has to go early as he always does. I mean, does that legacy that you talked about, Carol, does that sort of give you strength? Is that something that you could actively tap into or make a practice of in some ways? I think I, I, think I do because I think about, and especially during this pandemic, one of the thoughts I had was if this, if I had been in my situation during the Spanish flu, which wasn't Spanish at all, but that's another subject. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I would have been so isolated. We didn't have Zoom. We didn't have phone. Not everybody had, very few people had phones. I probably wouldn't have had a car. Mm -hmm. And I thought, because of all these people that came before, look at what we have. Mm -hmm. Look at what we can do. So instead of, you know, when I was hearing people complain that, oh, I can't do this and I can't do that, I'm thinking, yeah, but look at what we can do. We have Zoom, we have the computer, we have telephones, we have, you know, we can get movies into our home. Thank it's you, Carol. Amazing. I get that. I get it's that. amazing. Yeah, sure, yeah. Yeah. No, and that is that is so what I'm hearing is almost a resiliency practice by remembering sort of what who came before and what they went through and also what they've mm -hmm. provided. So thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to share? Okay, well, let us um, take a look at our mantra and our practice for the week. Can you write this down? So, mantra, this is one you may have heard before. In Pirkei Avot, who is honorable? One who honors others. Mm. And, um, I wrote a lot about this in my book because this was really, you know, as like an overachiever and a, and a 
honor chaser really didn't, you know, and I got caught up on a lot of what about me's in my life. Um, this really uh, took me a while to get my head around. Um, so um, remembering to honor others. And then for the practice, since today we've mostly talked about this idea that when we're in a good mental space, when we're feeling confident and good about ourselves, it's easier for us to be open to others. So we're gonna do some self-love self practices to kind of help mm -hmm. strengthen that part. So every day, try to notice yourself doing something good. We always recognize our mistakes, like, oh my God, I did this, oh man, I messed that up. But just to recognize something good that we've done, and then uh, also, um, you know, do something to try to give, to give some honor to yourself, you know, to give yourself some, some self, self love. Okay, and then when we check in, not that it's going to be a test, but I will check in next week and just see how, how these, these practices went. Okay, so let us close the way we began to close our sacred space with a short meditation. So once again, close your eyes. Take a deep breath through the nose and hold. And exhale through the mouth and hold. And bring to mind the face of someone from your past who really believed in you, who supported you, who encouraged you, who loved you. Maybe it was a parent or a grandparent or an aunt or an uncle. Maybe it was a teacher or a friend. Just let your body feel that acceptance and support from them. Something that you can continue to stand upon. As we reemerge from this time of isolation. to so remember how to connect with and be with other people in person. And touch your head back and smile. You have a moment of gratitude for those souls together, all of us together in this, in this last hour. When you're ready, you may open your eyes.